from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Our topic for today is the diagnosis and treatment of dental problems, or another way of putting it is we're going to look at dental care. Uh, after doing this program for 26 years, it's the first time to deal with this particular subject. We should have been dealing with it earlier, and it is our goal today to provide information that's very helpful to all of our good viewers in dealing with this very important issue. In order to accomplish that goal, I'm most pleased to welcome to the program Dr. Stan Rasmussen, who practices uh, in his field in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Our guest holds a BS degree from Andrews University in the state of Michigan, and he has a DDS from Loma Linda University in California. He has been practicing dentistry since 1986 in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Dr. Rasmussen, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the program. I know a lot about your background, and we're very fortunate to have you here today to discuss this very important topic. And as always, I'm very okay. pleased to have regular panelist Janelle Burke, who holds a degree of law and practices or is the law clerk to a judge in the state of Idaho, and I shall ask Janelle Burke to commence today's questioning. Welcome to our program, Dr. Thank Rasmussen. You. Dental Thank health you. has changed a lot over the years. Dental care has changed a lot over the years. Uh, what are some of the things that are different today from what they were, and how does that better control infection? I think uh, there's considerably more awareness of the need for dental care, and, and that uh, the idea that people can keep their teeth for a lifetime by paying attention and, and taking care of things. Over the years, um, an understanding of how to save teeth uh, that are badly decayed by uh, doing root canal therapies and castings, crowns, and bridge work. Uh, implantology is something that's uh, come up over the years that they've uh, refined and become to understand better how to replace missing teeth. People used to think that, that the teeth were needed to come out for a variety of reasons and I think you shared with us before the show one of the reasons that uh, they sometimes thought and also some of the other kind of folklore about teeth. People, uh, my grandfather lost his teeth thinking that that would help his arthritis, didn't make it any better. Uh, and also the attitude has been over the years that if it hurts just take it out and then my mom and dad had dentures, my sister has dentures, and the idea that I'll just need them. It's been very much the attitude over the years. That's changing a great deal, and we're seeing people keep their teeth much longer. What are some of the other ways that infection is controlled? For example, now people are very aware when they go to their dentist office whether or not the dentist is keeping everything uh, very clean and whether everything is very sterile in the dentist's office. These days, uh, that's exactly right. Everyone uh, uses the barrier techniques of wearing mask and gloves and gown, and, and uh, as much as possible, we use disposable items that don't get reused. The hand pieces, the instruments are all uh, run through a sterilization process, and uh, uh, very much a lot of awareness of that. And. Uh, why That's is that? Thing. Is that because so many diseases are carried through the mouth? Uh, I know there's a fear of AIDS, of course. There's been a more of an awareness, I think, because of the, the AIDS situation. And other than that, the diseases, uh, over the years, we probably should have been, been paying more attention to it. I remember it was my junior year of dental school when we were all to wear gloves and masks. and, and uh, it was the AIDS crisis that, that um, made us the most aware of it, I think. But uh, certainly in the mouth, um, full of bacteria, and, and there's, you're working with blood and saliva. And it's a good place to, uh, to transfer if you weren't using the correct barrier techniques. Can the dentist tell if you've got infection elsewhere in the body by looking in the mouth? I think that uh, you have to look at the body all as a whole, and certainly an infection in the mouth could affect other things. One, uh, diabetes shows up often early in the mouth, the health of the gums, and there are uh, a few things like that that you can detect early on of other systemic problems in the body. 
Dr. Rasmussen, we are going to talk for a while about something called diagnosis, uh, and it has a, a connection to Janelle's question that she asked earlier. Uh, I want to take you through a series of questions that, fortunately, you and I have had some time to talk, and uh, because of modern technology, we can do, uh, obviously, more in-depth diagnosis than we could many, many years ago. Uh, I'd like to start with, though, the difference in persons. I know that you, as a a doctor, a dentist, uh, you're, you're very sensitive to the fact that something you and I talked about, I guess there is some genetic uh, dispositions uh, to um, uh, have different treatment for different mm -hmm. persons. For some people, deterioration is greater. Uh, so would you talk about such things as x-rays and how often should one be checked? And uh, just take us through some of the things that you do to diagnose uh, a patient, suppose you have a new patient, sure. and, and the things that you're trying to find out and, and know something about their history and, and, and their care in the future. Sure. The, the medical history of the patient certainly one of the first things we sit down and talk about to get an idea of, of um, what their medical situation is, what uh, medicines or drugs they might be taking. Medicines can affect the health of the teeth. Dilantin is one that uh, uh, when we see somebody on Dilantin, certainly we see a difference in the health of their gum tissue. So to try to get to know that patient and to know uh, their medical history is real important in, in diagnosing and knowing what sort of care they might need. Patient that's had uh, radiation therapy to the head or neck, often the saliva is not the same quality of saliva and they're way more prone to, to rampant decay. So that I'd say would be the first thing. And then uh, um, certainly we take uh, we look intraorally in the mouth and, and look at things very carefully. As far as x-rays, uh, many offices these days take a panoramic x-ray which shows the whole upper and lower jaw all in one x-ray and that's, that's a, a good diagnostic tool. You can also look for tumors or cysts, problems that probably in a general practice we don't see that often but it's certainly important to find when we do. And then we take, uh, if there's certain problem areas of concern, uh, broken down teeth, we'll take a periapical that just zeroes in more just on that single tooth. And then the bite wing x-rays uh, are x-rays that look between the teeth where they touch for decay. That's one of the most important, it's all important, but certainly those bite wing x-rays, you have the opportunity to catch decay while it's just very small and starting and, and uh, um, promote good dental health that way. So I know you're really big on this that if you detect like the cavity very early, obviously the earlier you do the easier it is to treat. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and something we'll talk about later, <clears throat> root canal and so forth if you don't uh, diagnose early. Two things. Uh, one is that I know in talking to you that with patients, although you don't just have a rigid schedule, but there's certain kinds of x-rays for the de um, detection of some x-rays every year uh, and it puts people on like a two-year. Sure. Uh, and a five-year, could you, you've already talked a little about how there's different uh, uh, x-rays to find uh, a more comprehensive problem, but uh, do you also vary that from person to person? Some people yeah. need these, these x-rays more often than others. Sure, absolutely. We, uh, I think probably for our office, we've worked into the, the most common um, frequency for taking x-rays is every two years that we'll take the bite wing x-ray that looks between the teeth for decay spots in the the Panorex x-ray uh, that shows the entire upper and lower jaw and surrounding tissues we take probably in adults every four or five years. And, but then that's where you have to have a sense of, of your patient because some patients you might take an x-ray in a year or maybe six months depending on what their health is, what their rate of decay is. If you um, just only followed that strict rule of every couple of years for the bite wings, you'd miss a few things. And certainly the visual examination will, will guide Absolutely. you some too. Absolutely, yeah. I, my next round, I'm going to talk about prevention. You're very good at that. We're going to talk about some things that can help, but I'm going to let Janelle uh, commence uh, her next series of questions. One very frequent dental disease is gum disease. And it, what is it exactly? Can you define it for our viewers and about how many people have it? Um, in adults, they say statistically probably 75% of the adults will have gum disease at some point in their life. It's, a, it's one of the most prevalent diseases really. And the problem with gum disease is you very likely won't really know that you have gum disease until it, until it starts to hurt unless you are educated to look for the sign, signs and symptoms. Um, gum disease is essentially caused by the 
the uh, bacteria in the mouth that form plaque and then uh, the calculus, the mineralization that occurs on the teeth mixed in with the bacteria and the plaque and uh, there's toxins then from this that are on the, the surface of the tooth. It's very irritating to the gum and the bone. It seems that after, uh, say, the age of 25, the body doesn't tolerate that irritation of the uh, material building up on the, the surfaces of the tooth. And it, the body responds by having an inflammation response and uh, becoming the gum becomes swollen and bleeds easily. And ultimately, as that uh, let progress, the bone and the gum tissue start to shrink away from around the tooth. And uh, essentially, your tooth visually starts to look a little longer and the gums peeling back. And in the worst case scenario of gum disease, people lose teeth because of that. The teeth get loose and wiggly and move. What are some other symptoms that people might look for if they suspect they have gum disease? Um, bleeding gums. Bleeding of the gum is certainly one of them. Uh, mobility in the tooth. Uh, in advancing gum disease, there will be uh, pus and exudate between the teeth, and um, breath odor can come with gum disease. How is gum disease treated then? What's best to do for it? Basically, by removing that irritation. If you could, if we could all do a perfect job and have absolute perfect oral health care, oral hygiene. Uh, which probably none of us really can do, then we wouldn't have the trouble that we have with gum disease that we have. Uh, in the office, uh, once that's diagnosed, we, in an advanced case of gum disease, we go through a series of cleanings that are a little more of an advanced cleaning than just an average cleaning for somebody that's on a regular maintenance in the office. And uh, it gets often referred to as a deep cleaning. And uh, among dentists, it's referred to as a root planing and scaling, where they're actually going down below the gum and smoothing that root surface and making it very clean, trying to remove the toxins so that that gum can then heal up around the tooth and, uh, and stop the gum disease process. What I hear you saying then is there are different kinds of cleanings. Uh, I'm, I'm taking it that you, first of all, would say to people, floss. Absolutely. <laughs> and then secondly, you would say to people, um, see your dentist regularly. Sure. And, and that probably would in, involve some kind of a routine cleaning, but the schedule might depend upon the individual. Yeah, it's very individualized. Some folks, uh, and, and I might add, one of the most important things out of treating gum disease is helping that patient to understand the importance of ongoing care. Because uh, if you, say you come in and you've got moderate to advanced gum disease, uh, and you go through all this cleaning work and the expense and the time and sitting in the chair and then you disappear for a couple of years, you can come back and be exactly in the same shape or maybe even worse because of the time that's gone by and uh, uh, that's extremely important to convince the patient and help them to understand that it has to be a lifetime commitment to, to maintaining that gum disease. And if it eventually gets bad enough, the person might see a periodontist? Periodontists are specialists in treating gum disease and absolutely we refer certain of the cases that after we've worked with the patient to an extent uh, to the specialist to determine if there's something more that can be done to, uh, to help stop their gum disease, uh, keep it from getting worse. Janelle built a bridge. I want to talk about several techniques in preventive care, but also when you're dealing with <coughs> gum disease, you're also working on preventive uh, uh, measures or the not to cause it to deteriorate more. I'll start with children because uh, Stan, you and I were talking this morning about, uh, and for our viewers who have young children, mm -hmm. that there's certain things that can happen that are, that are so positive that you indicated that a child could possibly go through life and have little or no cavities. And so sure. let's start with them, then we'll talk about other people who already passed that stage mm -hmm. and, and how they can uh, prevent some problems. Uh, fluoride is one of the biggest things that pops into my mind. Uh, we. Uh, have seen such a difference with the kids that have been on fluoride. I, I know that uh, through talking to dentists that have been dentists way longer than I have and, and talking about how that the kids that they used to see would have uh, the crowns or the caps on nearly all of their back teeth or that they might be just losing their teeth. And then to see the transition where they say now that fluoride is available, we're seeing kids without any cavities at all. And uh, um, Ideally, we start children on, on fluoride before they're born, prenatally. All of my kids, mom had uh, vitamins with fluoride. And uh, what that does is the fluoride 
gets incorporated into the tooth structure as it's being formed and into the primary teeth and the permanent tooth. And uh, it makes that tooth structure more resistant to decay. And uh, so that's one of the biggest things uh, for kids coming up is to have that exposure to fluoride while they're in their tooth forming years. Uh, another way that fluoride is helpful is topically. So in the schools, many times they'll have fluoride rinse programs where they'll uh, have the children rinsing with fluoride once a week or whatever. And that fluoride then soaks in topically into the teeth that are erupted in the mouth now and helps harden them and make them more resistant to, de to decay. We also do fluoride treatments in the office that d does the very same thing. Uh, the other thing that pops into my mind as far as kids is uh, sealants. Sealants have made a big difference. Uh, it's essentially a plastic coating that's painted onto the, to the biting surface, surface of the tooth into the little grooves and fissures that are there naturally. And that's one of the most common areas to see decay start. And uh, with sealants and fluorides, we truly are seeing a lot of people uh, decay and restoration free. Now, that, that starts early, but as you get older and there are some problems, and some of those techniques are not the ones that you would use, is that correct? That, that's, yeah, that, the, the most advantage of that is, is uh, as those teeth are forming and then the kids are growing up. But again, we're, we've been talking about the differences in the formation of the mouth and the teeth, and there's certain genetic ties. Some, of the people, excuse me, some individuals are born, and as they grow older, they just have such a perfect set of teeth and how they're formed, and others have much more space between them and so forth. So since people have this different structure, I assume, also again from conversation with you, Dr. Rasmussen, how often they must, they must have certain kind of treatments and cure varies. Would you take us through two or three different types of an individual, an, an older individual that would need to come in only once a year for cleaning, others would need to come in every three months. So why is there such a difference? Sure, it's, it's very individualized. I think, uh, I don't know exactly why. You know, nature didn't didn't create us all equally and fairly, and uh, and then also the environment we're exposed to. Some have had fluoride. There's actually natural fluoride in the water in some areas in Colorado, for example, and then the 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 care people take of things. Certainly, you have to customize that treatment plan to the individual person. Um, the the things that uh, you look for in children, you don't look for in the the middle-aged population in, in older adults, they tend to have, uh, for example, uh, gum disease has had more time to affect some of our older patients, and so uh, there may be more of a tendency for root surface caries, for example, for decay on the root surface that hasn't been exposed, hasn't uh, had the advantage of, of fluoride over the years. Maybe it's more newly exposed and more prone to decay. And uh, Let's go through uh, individuals that come in and you you've got them in quite good shape, best you can get them at that point. And now you're going to put them on, the, they're going to be your patient for a long time, you're going to put them on certain schedules and treatment. Let's take patients through that. One is that, suppose it's a person that has quite a bit of trouble, so you bring them in every three months for a okay. cleaning. Mm -hmm. The cleaning, of course, is to get that plaque off that they're not getting from their daily brushing and other treatments. And then, uh, once that you're keeping a lot of that plaque off, but then because the person has a lot of trouble, you proposed deep cleaning. Give us the difference between regular cleaning and deep cleaning and, and how often would you do deep cleaning on a patient sure. normally? I don't know that there's a set standard on how often. I'm sure the insurance companies have some set yeah. standard. It depends on how rapidly you're seeing the reoccurrence of the buildup of the tooth, of the uh, mineralization, the placket, and uh, so on. The differences tend to be, a regular cleaning tends to be more just the removal of the above the gum line um, accumulation of plaque and calculus, whereas the deep cleaning or the root planning and scaling uh, is to go down into the pockets, as we call them, and uh, remove the buildup below the gum line. A pocket is where the gum is attached to the bone and the root of the tooth, and at some point it just comes up around the tooth and is unattached. And so in that space right there is where we have to where we have to do the deep cleaning. So by uh, doing that, you really prevent uh, greater problems uh, of removing that that would be like gum disease or even possibly loss of the tooth. Absolutely, as that, uh, as that material that we're cleaning off below the gum builds up, it gets to be quite a place for bacteria to breed and to, to uh, hang out, so to speak. There even get bacteria there that uh, uh, down in the sulcus or in the pocket that can't live in the presence of oxygen, for example, that are even more destructive than the other bacteria that are in the mouth, 
And uh, so to clean that area and to make it so that it's cleansable by the patient is what we're after with that deep cleaning. Unfortunately, time just rushes when we're doing such an interesting program, but I want to have you do something else, and that is, I'm your patient, I'm sitting in your chair, and you're going to tell me everything I need to do between these three-month visits or six months, whatever it is, and, and cleaning and so forth. I know you're going to talk about flossing, but tell us all the kind of things that I can do that can be most helpful to you to guide us through our preventive care. That you as the patient can yes. do in between times of seeing yes. us, okay. Well, certainly the thoroughness of brushing and flossing, and uh, I view that as the, the home care and keeping that surface clean. We can restore the surface, we can get it cleaned off well, but then the patient needs to go home and keep it clean, and I think that's probably the biggest thing. Beyond that... Can uh, I interrupt and say sure. that the kind of toothbrush you use is important? Absolutely. The way you brush? That's you don't right. just brush straight across. A lot of it. folks, there's probably several acceptable ways to brush. The way I would say to brush might not be the way someone okay. else would, although certainly there's cert some parameters you want to follow. Yeah. Um, and then the, the floss, uh, flossing, it gets, uh, toothbrush can't get all of that. The toothbrush doesn't get between the teeth right. where they're touching, and so the floss will slip between the teeth and down below the gum and to clean there. And that's also real important. We try to spend time with our patients to make sure they understand what they're trying to to accomplish through the flossing and the brushing because certainly there can be some misconceptions and you might be uh, loyally, vigorously flossing every day but not doing it right. So. Yeah, and then in addition to that, there, there's still certain, even flossing doesn't get there, other instruments or, or things you can use? Sure, there's a, um, there's a whole lot of different instruments you can use for helping keep your teeth clean. There's uh, uh, flossing uh, aids, things that hold the floss for somebody that doesn't have the, quite the dexterity. Um, one thing that we've seen help people extremely is actually the, the electric uh, toothbrushes, the mechanical uh, toothbrushes that, that help with some of the cleaning of the teeth. And uh, seems some massaging the gums. The massaging the gums, and, and there's several out there now, and uh, I think probably all of them can be good if they're used right. I'm going to go to one other area that we just have to get in, I'm going to go back because I know Janelle has another question on the area, but this is one of the ones that we just can't get off the air without because we want to lay to rest some. I guess hysteria almost is out there. Uh, if there's anything that, that uh, people dread about dentists is walking in and being examined and saying you're going to have a root canal. Mm -hmm. uh, would you explain to us what that is about and the difference between a root canal and just a regular filling? Sure. There's quite a difference. You know that, that the, word root, the words word, root canal, they probably should have picked a better name because they're not, it's not so bad, but it's, it's a, it certainly helped us to save lots of teeth. Essentially, uh, what a root canal is, is inside the tooth, when the tooth formed, there was uh, blood vessels, um, nerve tissue, connective tissue in this tooth that aided in the forming of the tooth, and it remains inside the tooth. It meets, it comes up in a little canal or a little tunnel up in from each root of the tooth and meets in the top part of the tooth, the crown, in what we call the pulp chamber. And for various reasons, uh, deep decay in the tooth, trauma to the tooth, or a crack in the tooth, this, this pulp or this um, soft part of the tooth can die. And when it, when it dies, that's what causes pain. Sometimes it, the soft tissue tries to swell and it's in the encasement of a, of, a, of a tooth, which is hard, and there's not room to swell, so it can almost strangulate itself off. And as that tooth starts to die, then you start to have pain with it. Essentially, what a root canal is, is where you numb the patient up, you go in and remove the decay or whatever has uh, of that sort of thing that might have caused the need for the root canal, clean out into those little canals and uh, make them very clean and then seal them up with sealer material so that it's no longer a open space down in the tooth for tissue fluid and bacteria to go start another infection. And you have uh, all kinds of measures to make sure that there's not pain, if, if there is you can stop and do Absolutely. more. Absolutely. You know, uh, I think most dentists these days, we don't I don't want to work on a patient if it's hurting them. So we try to be very attentive to that. Also, sometimes if a tooth's really infected, maybe that isn't the best time to work on it. Sometimes mm -hmm. a patient gets antibiotics, mm -hmm. uh, some pain medicine, let that tooth kind of calm down a little before you actually go in and work on the root canal. But if you fill it without doing that, all you're doing is sealing that over and it's not going to cure the problem. Absolutely. Often we'll get the question, can't you just fill it, doc? <laughs> and if that pulp has been involved, then your only choice really remains to either do the root canal or lose the tooth. And uh, so it's not really an issue, can you fill it or not? It's an issue sure. of how to solve that. 
in Elkhart. Well, I'm going to ask a series of questions about things that I think people might want to know about bridges, braces, and, and lost teeth. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, bridges. Uh, what, what is the use of a bridge? When, when do people use bridges? A, a bridge is to replace a missing tooth, essentially. And uh, if you have a, a, a missing tooth, then essentially what a bridge is is a crown on the tooth on either side with a false tooth suspended between. And it's and dentists call them fixed bridges. It's not that it's broken, it's that it's fixed in your mouth and doesn't come in and out. And uh, that's probably one of the traditionally um, best, nicest ways to replace a missing tooth in that it, it seems the most natural. It doesn't come in and out. And what about braces? A lot of young people today are wearing braces and, and not so young too. too. That's yeah, correct. Absolutely. Um, braces are an excellent, excellent thing, not only for cosmetics, but because of uh, helping to align people's bites such that they're, they're biting correctly and uh, for various reasons to prevent excess wear on the teeth and then obviously the cosmetic aspect of it. And uh, Tony, you're right, that's the, a neat thing because you don't necessarily have to be a, a young person to, to be able to be advantaged by having braces. What about lost teeth? That is the tooth that's knocked out. You're on the playground or you're, you're out somewhere and you get a bang. Uh, the tooth isn't necessarily knocked out. What can you do? Uh, if, a tooth was, if a tooth was knocked out, is that what you're asking? Well, let, let's start with if one it's that's just, maybe halfway out. If and it's then just part one way out. Yeah. Um, if it's possible, get to the dentist's office as soon as you can. But to, to basically reposition that tooth, even if it's kind of crude, is probably the best thing. With, and then uh, the dentist, uh, when you get to the dental office, tries to stabilize that to split it together as best you can. And then depending on how badly it's been moved, it might need a root canal therapy. Or many times when they're, when they're knocked partly out, they're also broken. And uh, we try to restore that. But it's worth giving it a try, Absolutely. Right? Yeah, it's amazing uh, what, you, what you can save that the general public might not think savable. What, not, I'm going to have to interrupt, <laughs> Sergeant Nell. We'll have to have Dr. Rasmussen <laughs> back. Uh, on behalf of uh, Janelle Burke and our staff, Dr. Uh, Stan Rasmussen, we thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. As I indicate at the beginning of the program, it's the first time we've done uh, a show on dental care. And I am next year going to invite you back. There's so many areas we didn't cover that we want to cover. You. And uh, you've been very informative and I know helped our viewers on how, one, to take care of their own teeth, and secondly, what they should do and get certainly to a dentist and, and get that care. Thank you again from our staff. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you found, I believe you found our show to be most informative for you today, and I invite you to be with us again next week when we discuss yet another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.